I want to show you this chart. It tracks Everton's league position since the last time they qualified for Europe. A gradual and agonising slump towards the lower rungs of the table. To call those eight years a wild ride would be an understatement. In short, Everton Football Club have grossed 650 million on new players, rotated through nine managers and three directors of football, recipients of a financial fair play investigation, dismissed a number of its board members, and most recently managed to claw their way out of two back-to-back -back relegation fights on the final day of the season. And as a fan who supported Everton since I was this age, it's been very difficult to watch. It's safe to say this toffee depression hasn't gone unnoticed in the media. Everton are the worst run club in the country. Spent fi over 500 million pounds. Where's all these youngsters? There's, there's no foundation at the club. You cannot allow a football club of this magnitude to consistently be flailing in the wind like it's been. They've got away from relegation twice now. Yeah. And there won't be a third time. The context of this decline is even more remarkable given a 52,000-seater stadium waits in the wings from the 2024-25 season. And so, with the team dancing with relegation, an ownership devoid of ideas or cash, and a fan base at boiling point, the question becomes, what has gone so wrong at Everton Football Club? Let's rewind back to that chart a minute, and I want to double-click on this area right here, because Everton seemed to pull off the impossible. One of the greatest managers of all time, making Goodison his home. The excitement this coup generated was the greatest it had been in years. Wow. Would a three-time European Cup winner finally give Everton the incentive to break through into the so-called top six? With the host of summer signings at his back, at first it appeared so. A fantastic start, fourth by Christmas. We are fighting for Europe. Um... <laughs> And now we are in good position. And then it all suddenly fell flat. Bad results, injuries, an underwhelming mid-table finish. Compound this disappointment, Ancelotti would wave bye-bye to Everton in favour of some Spanish club less than two years into a four-year contract. Looking back, this for me is a huge turning point. All of that belief, that expectation, that energy suddenly squashed and then immediately curb stomped by hiring an ex-Liverpool manager who previously had this to say about Everton. Well, we were trying, you know, but when you play with uh, small clubs, always it's, it's difficult. They play deep and they try to, to do the same. The appointment, quite frankly, was insanity. The fans disliked him, he dismissed the club's two best playmakers, and after nine losses in 13, left the club in 15th position. But this right here encapsulates one of the fundamental problems in Everton's decline. When Lampard was appointed, he was Everton's eighth manager in seven years. Rotating managers doesn't guarantee failure, of course. Some of the most successful clubs recycle faster than this guy on garbage day. But bouncing from playstyle to playstyle, from Coleman to Allardyce, from Ancelotti to Benitez, hiring coaches in January that barely last a year, it never allows a squad to master the attacking and defensive patterns of play required to succeed within any given system. Clubs have to pick an identity, pick a group of players that fit an identity and then bring a coach in that fits that style. That's the ideal scenario. I'm not saying you always get it right, but Everton have moved from one end of the spectrum to the other. They've got no consistency. They're all over the place. The majority of managers were supported well in the transfer market, which sounds great until you're left with a mishmash of players suited to different systems, signed to long-term overinflated contracts. So when Lampard picks up the squad, it's another six months of finding favourites and tweaking formations, which almost sleepwalks the club into relegation, if not for a miracle against Crystal Palace. Right there and then, the relief at full time was palpable. In Lampard, there was a connection with the fans, but also a recognition that this cannot become the norm because we have secured our safety and then it's time to think about how do we try and make sure we're not here again next year because there are reasons why we're here and we have to try and, and, and work on those over the summer. But then it did. Another sorry start, nine managers in eight years, players left that were never replaced, another last gas winner at Goodison, only this time the reaction was different. Something was fundamentally wrong with the club at its core. Under Ancelotti, there was an argument that both him and the players underperformed. But this squad today had earned its place in the league. It wasn't a one-off, it was a trend. And the common thread that weaves throughout this whole story leads only to the top. It was 2016 when Farhad Mashiri took control of Everton as majority shareholder. On paper, he appeared to take all of the boxes. Experience as a minority shareholder at Arsenal, guarantee of substantial player investment, and perhaps most importantly of all, a promise to deliver on the 52,000-seater stadium at Bramley Moor Dock. 
Those within the club gleamed with praise, and Mishiri himself delivered a strong vision for the club. After smashing the club record for incoming transfers in his first summer window, fans were cautiously optimistic. And yet just one year in, question marks began to develop around the club's ownership, finances and decision making. In 2017, as part of the Paradise Paper leak, documents suggest Mashiri's funding in the acquisition of Everton may have been provided as a gift from Alishir Usmanov, Russian billionaire, friend of Vladimir Putin and previous business partner of Mashiri as minority shareholder at Arsenal. Mashiri of course denied these claims, but already within the year, there was a sour taste to his reign. Whilst no conclusive evidence was found around ownership, there was no denying Usmanov's investments into Everton. USM Holdings became a key sponsor of the club shortly after Mashiri's arrival, and by the 2019-20 season accounted for at least 65% of all sponsorship receipts for that financial year. This reliance on USM sponsorship would come back to haunt them after sanctions were placed on Usmanov following the war in Ukraine. Everton were quick to cut ties, but this breakdown led to a sizable financial hole to cover over. And this was only the beginning. Question marks over the club's finances extend well beyond the sponsorship deals. Whilst Mashiri generously supported managers upon arrival, Benitez, Lampard, Daesh have all experienced tighter budgets due to financial fair play allegations pointed at the club. In a nutshell, Premier League clubs are allowed to lose up to 105 million over three years. Between 2018 and 2021, Everton lost 370 million. To put this in context, that is 150 million worse than the next largest loss maker during that period. Now, of course, there's an asterisk next to that number. Certain losses from the pandemic could be deducted, as can investments on infrastructure, community schemes, as well as women's and academy teams. A significant portion of these losses still pertain to the new stadium, which Everton hope will squeeze them under the 105 million limit. Squeezing their way under this amount though doesn't disregard the wild and erratic player and managerial decisions made over the last eight years. Decisions that mean managers paid off, overinflated player wages, and having to sell key players at the club just to keep the book straight. It screams gross negligence and fans have the right to voice their opinions for change at the top of the club. This back and forth between ownership and fans has only served to exacerbate issues, with them now completely absent from any and all home games at Goodison Park. It's just not sustainable. And whilst fingers should rightly be pointed at Mashiri, there's still one large elephant in the room that we haven't touched on. Bill Kemright has been associated with Everton since 1989. He became chairman in 2004. He oversaw a strong era under David Moyes. He found a willing backer in Mashiri, and he obviously has his supporters in the media that continue to defend him. But the reality is, he's been right there with Mashiri during this whole decline. The managers, the finances, the transfers. Because when it comes to him, the truth of the matter is this. Love for a club should not be mistaken for level-headed, competent leadership. Which is exactly what Everton need right now to get out of this mess and compete at the highest level. It's been quite a roller coaster for Everton over the last few years. And yet, in light of these problems, they're still in the Premier League, they still have a new stadium coming, and they have unbelievable fans that will stick with them through thick and thin. New investment also appears on the horizon, which hopefully will bring some more good fortune to get out of this situation. It still feels inevitable though that Mashiri and Kemright's reign is surely going to come to an end once the stadium is complete. The club is dying for a fresh start and some fresh eyes at the helm. And for all their faults, if they manage to scrape Everton through another season and deliver a state-of-the-art new stadium, it could be a new, successful and exciting chapter for the club's history. Or maybe I'm just being optimistic. It's better than nothing. Everton, aren't we?